Thanks for joining us. I'm Maria Sorreo. The city of Rancho Palos Verdes is stepping up its efforts to monitor the Rancho LPG storage facility in San Pedro. The facility located near the border of Rancho Palos Verdes stores more than 25 million gallons of butane and propane in two large refrigerated tanks. Recently, the city council voted unanimously to become a more active participant in working with the city of Los Angeles and the agencies that regulate the operation. Residents concerned about public safety asked the council to be more proactive. RPV Mayor Anthony Mizetich discussed the issue with Liz Brown Swanson. The action by the city council last Tuesday night uh, steps up our vigilance even more. Uh, we've asked the neighboring cities to come on board and, you know, uh, be a concerned party, if you will, uh, about the facility and, and make sure that monitoring and instead, you know, it, yes, uh, keep the monitoring uh, in place, be vigilant about it, uh, talk to the city of Los Angeles and all the regulatory agencies, EPA, fire department. Uh, all the California uh, agencies that are concerned about these types of facilities, keep them in uh, on the facility to make sure that they remain in compliance. And so we're, we're forming that co coalition as a result of the city council action to uh, make sure that all the cities are, you know, watching this and being vigilant as well. But, but why now all of a sudden, I mean, this has been a, an issue if it comes up and it goes away. Why all of a sudden now were the residents coming forward and asking you? Was there something that sort of came up? That well, the residents actually, yeah, they, uh, they approached uh, Council Member Brooks and uh, brought it to her attention. She mm -hmm. brought it to the council uh, as an agenda item so we could discuss it and, and learn more about the facility. Right, and I know one thing I noticed that kept coming up repeatedly was about insurance. Like, yes. And I know and, that you and, directed and, staff to, to find out about what kind of insurance does this facility have, right? Yeah, because there's, there's two uh, different versions of what a worst case scenario would be and how bad it would be. Um, and insurance was one of, the, one of the key issues that we discussed in that, in that, uh, in that council meeting. And so we made a motion that the city attorney would seek the insurance coverage from Ranch LPG, and they were more than willing to offer their insurance coverage and provide that to the city attorney. So we as a council will be aware of what their insurance coverage is should they have some type of, um, you know, mishap. Okay. Anything you want to add again, just so we can inform residents rather than to alarm them that there's, you know, just to... Oh, I mean, the, the facility is being operated in full compliance. It is uh, meeting all the requirements of the regulatory agencies, but we just want to make sure right. that it is... You're doing your due diligence. That we are doing our due diligence, protecting our residents, um, and uh, making sure that they're operating it in, you know, like I said, in, in full compliance, and making the other neighboring cities aware of this issue so that they can weigh in on it and um, uh, put the same kind of pressure that we are putting in as a neighboring city on both the, the facility and also on the city of LA because it's, it's actually in their, right. their um, uh, area, but our residents are nearby. So mm -hmm. we have to be very vigilant looking out for our residents. A representative from Rancho LPG addressed the council and emphasized the facility's clean record since opening in 1973. The facility is owned by Plains LPG and is inspected frequently with nearly a dozen agencies overseeing the plant. And at Trump National, it's a sign of the times that a new Trump sign has been officially installed. The Trump National Drive sign was received with a celebration at Trump National. With all the details, here's Liz. Okay, Maria, well, here I am standing on Trump National Drive. The name is official and everyone here is celebrating. So we are very, very excited and we, again, it's a long time coming and to be able to see that, you know, after eight years of working here personally, it's, it's a great, great um, thing to have happen. So we're happy. And so you're having a party. Talk about what's going on here. We absolutely are. Um, it's a celebration and in honor of the name change, but it's also a way to say thank you to the residents that really are our neighbors, Ladera, Linda, Seaview, and anyone else who heard about this, you know, they just come on down and they're having a great time. And again, it's a great way for us to get to know them and to let them know about exciting things coming up. Um, I know you 
said you were the Ladera Linda Homeowners Association. Talk about the excitement of what's happening here at Trump's tonight. Oh, well, we're delighted that they decide, the city council has decided to change the name of the street. I think we're very happy Trump is here. Like uh, Trump's very much, and we come up here very often. And I appreciate what Trump is doing for the neighborhood. And I think it's a good thing that uh, the city council allowed it. And how about you? I, you agree with your wife, I'm sure. But what do you think, what do you like about having this right here in your neighborhood? Oh, it's wonderful, especially with the renaming of the street. I think that's very appropriate. This is a nice event. Uh, Trump goes out of their way to, uh, to take care of the neighborhood, I believe. I mean, we've had several meetings with them, talked about emergency preparedness and uh, how we could interface with them during a, an emergency and, and so forth, uh, supplies and places for people to stay. Joining me now is former RPV Mayor Marilyn Lyon, of course, also now chairman of the board of the Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, and you have many titles, but <laughs> today you're here to celebrate what's going on with the name change of Trump National. Talk about that. You've seen a lot happen to finally get to this point. I I have seen a lot happen. I mean, Ocean Trails was great while it lasted, but now it's Trump National and and the, the name change is proper. And I think uh, when people are coming from far away, they're not familiar with the peninsula, it makes sense they're going to be looking for the name Trump. This helps people get here. Well, I think it's great. I think it's great for him to, to offer this to the neighborhood. And uh, in fact, I drove by this afternoon and I saw the actual sign go up and they were, you know, making sure it was level. It was, it was great. It doesn't get better, any better than this. You have a new tapas menu going on right now. Yeah, actually, uh, we're starting our new tapas launch and we actually decided to coincide with the actual sign changing for, our, for the club. So it was kind of a win-win situation. Uh, we are starting our new tapas Thursday. So every Thursday from now on, we will have a small limited tapas menu with just little, little bites of food, you know, and cocktails to go along with it. Your boss, Donald Trump, is not here. But what do you think he's thinking about the, the, the progress, I guess, that you might call that's being made? I think he's very happy about it. I think he understands that there is a shift. Um, and that he is also embracing it too. He's very happy about that. It's something that is, you know, less of a worry to him now. And he just he knows that things are moving in a positive direction. And I think all of us we want to make it continue to go down that road. And of course, the best way to find out what's happening here is to go on to TrumpNationalLosAngeles.com. Back to you in the studio, Maria. Every year, the Palos Verdes Chamber of Commerce celebrates a very deserving resident who stands out for all they do in our community and beyond, and this year was no exception. Liz Brown Swanson caught up with the new Citizen of the Year, Rosemary Humphrey. Hi, Maria. I'm here at the 2012 Citizen of the Year Awards. There are more than 200 people here, all to recognize outstanding volunteers. Being named this year's Citizen of the Year is outstanding community leader Rosemary Humphrey. Also being recognized are two nonprofit organizations, the San Pedro Peninsula YMCA and the Kiwanis Club of Rolling Hills Estates. Let's check out the awards. deserve being citizen of the year. You're citizen of the year every year, but congratulations. Thank you. I'm really honored to have this, and actually I'm honored to have this because I represent, I feel, all the volunteers we have on the peninsula. I didn't do it alone. I accept this award on behalf of everyone who labored alongside me, whether it's uh, children, adults, senior citizens, we all did it together. So I'm real thrilled for the recognition. You've served on the Palos Verdes Estate City Council for years. You're principal of Rancho Del Mar, PTA, go on and on, great mom, outstanding woman. What motivates you? I think what motivates me is the opportunity to actually work with people. That's what I like. When I, when I was asked to run for city council originally, I said, I'm not a politician. I'm just a volunteer that likes to work with people. And the then mayor said, but that's the kind of person we want on our council, the, the kind of person that likes to work with people, and that's it. So I've always just responded to people, assisted people, helped people, and I found it, it pays it forward. In turn, they support me, they support my activities. So it works in the whole community. But also, you wear so many hats. You're also principal at Rancho Del Mar. How is that going? I mean, that's very exciting for you. Well, Rancho Del Mar is a wonderful experience. I took that job about 12 years ago. 
when they needed a new principal and I said, well, I'll do it for a year till you find a permanent person. I found I really loved being able to design a program for students that need to accelerate their program in an individualized way, whether it be to catch up or to graduate early. And so many of them come back, come, come back and said, you made a difference in my life and uh, thank you, keep it going. And it's just a wonderful program, wonderful staff and great support from the district. Rosemary uh, exemplifies the best that the community has to offer. I've known Rosemary for over 20 years. We both came onto the city councils together in the early 90s, and Rosemary stayed, and she stuck with it. But then later on, um, I worked together with Rosemary in the school system, and she's at Rancho Del Mar as the principal, and I was a special education teacher with her. And I have to say, she is so completely dedicated to the citizens of the community, not just Palos Verdes Estates, the students in our community, and the overall well-being of the people. And I just think she stands for everything we want to be, and the world is a better place because Rosemary is here. We are so excited to honor the iconic Rosemary Humphrey as Citizen of the Year, the San Pedro, YM, San Pedro and Peninsula YMCA for their 95 years of service. They're going to receive our Best Nonprofit Award and the Gwanis Club of Rolling Hills Estates will be receiving the Outstanding Community Service Program Award, which is a brand new award this year. This award has gone on since 1976. The theme tonight is about creating opportunities. All these honorees understand, about, uh, understand creating opportunities. Talk about that. Well, they have all gone above and beyond in terms of their hours, their commitment, their dedication to creating opportunities for others, whether it's the scholarship program that the Kiwanis Club puts together, or Rosemary when she's mentoring students in her role as a professional educator, or the San Pedro Y, which is open to anyone regardless of age or income. So you will hear this evening during the course of the program just a myriad of ways in which these organizations are giving back to the community and improving the quality of life for everyone. Okay, Maria, it was really great being here at the 2012 Citizen of the Year Awards. Congratulations to all the honorees. Back to you in the studio. And when we come back, we take you to a local school where parents and teachers work together in the classroom. And in sports, a Dodger pitcher wins a prestigious award and his wife is celebrated for her work as well. We'll be right back. When you're driving, distractions can cause injury and death. Drivers who text while operating a vehicle are 23 times more likely to cause an accident. In 2009, over 25,000 tickets were written for cell phone violations. Remember, in the state of California, talking on a phone without a hands-free device is against the law. Loud music is also distracting. When you drive, keep your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel. There are three main types of distractions. Visual, taking your eyes off the road. Manual, taking your hands off the wheel. And cognitive, taking your mind off what you're doing. Keep your eyes on the road and we all stay safe. There's a lot to enjoy in RPV. Just watch Armchair Traveler on RPV TV. We may not get to Europe, but by golly, if you come with me, John Clayton, you'll find out just how much there is to see in RPV every single day. I say, that sounds super. It's been 20 years since Cornerstone Elementary opened its doors with the concept of parents joining the teachers in the classroom. I had a chance to catch up with some teachers, parents, and students who attended the 20th anniversary celebration, and they're all very proud to be a part of the Cornerstone family. We believe in parent participation, parents in the classroom, not just to cut and paste or file, but are actually supportive members uh, assistance, if you will, in the classroom so that the teacher can truly teach. She can or he can share a concept with a small group while other parents are working with other small groups, art, science, math, whatever. So parents in the classroom is what we believe in. From a teaching perspective, it must be kind of exciting for kids to have their parents in school with them sometimes. Oh, they love having their parents in school and they love having their dads here 
on occasion. That We always have some dads that spend a lot of time and then we have some dads that are only able to spend a little bit of time and the kids get really excited when their parent, parents are here. What, what is, what's the parents' favorite things to do when they're in the classroom? Um, I think they like working directly with the children with mm -hmm. a project, either an art project or say doing a math game or a sight word bingo or some kind of a skill. I think they enjoy really feeling like they're making a difference with the kids and um, enhancing the curriculum. It also seems like it must be very rewarding for the parents to be able to spend more time with their kids, especially when you're working or you're busy all the time. Well, they get to know the whole picture of what education is all about. Plus, they can be more supportive of, of what their children are doing in school and help them to be successful. No, this, this school is amazing. And, and again, you could probably go to universities and go to experts on public education and what it takes to build a successful school, but this is school is a model of that. Um, you know, you have, the parents are just very involved. You have an outstanding teaching staff. You have an outstanding principal who carries the vision of the school. So it's, it, it really, it's really a family atmosphere. It's like a team working together to make this happen. This doesn't happen by accident. This success is because the team is here doing it. You know, when, when you sign up to come to Cornerstone, every family signs a contract that you are required to put in a certain amount of hours. And it's, a, you know, depending on how many children you have, those are the shifts that you're assigned. You got to just work it into your schedule. And we're blessed to be able to invest in this time with our kids. And it's, it's worth the scramble in the morning to, you know, get ready for work and get your kids and then to leave work to come to do your shifts at school, but it's a special, special opportunity for the parents. What's it like for you as a parent to come into a classroom and work with your kids? It's very humbling uh, at first because you very quickly see how hard it is to be a teacher. Yep. And while our classes are relatively small, uh, it's just 24 kids. Mm -hmm. uh, in second grade, where I'm a teaching parent, they're like herdy cats and they're going in all they're going in all directions uh, but the way that the, the teacher carries that energy and directs it and 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 the smiles and and the fun that the kids are having while they're learning is is very humbling uh, for me I mean I I think I'm lucky to have the opportunity to be able to spend just that little bit of time uh, in the classroom helping out wherever I can help out uh, as one of the teaching parents. Most of the parents that I've met here come from well-educated backgrounds, nice families. They understand the importance of a good education. What's it like to have your mom or your dad in the classroom while you're at school during the day? Well, it's fun because like, if I need help, they always come over and help me and stuff. As a student, what is that like to have your parents in the classroom? I think it's actually pretty fun. It is fun. To have them come into your classroom and help out with the teacher. And what kind of things do they do when you're in the classroom? They help out with the teacher. Um, sometimes when you need help on work or you need it corrected, um, then they'll do it for you. Tell me what it's like to have your mom in the classroom with you. Well, I think it's great because she can know what I do in class and she can just know what we're doing. I just want to congratulate Cornerstone on 20 great years. It's uh, I can I can meet with superintendents all over Los Angeles County, and I can see comparisons. This is like one of the finest schools anywhere. For over 50 years, a group of local writers have been getting together each week at the Palos Verdes Library. I had a chance to visit with the group and meet many authors who have had books published, and two who became publishers right here in our community. I haven't been here since the 50s, but um, the writing group has, and we have one member who's been here about 30 years. Um, I've been coming 15 years, which makes the lie about my age a little awkward, but <laughs> and um, it's a great group. It meets uh, once a week on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's been here all along. Its name is the uh, Millie Ames Writing Group. She's the founder, and um, that she's the one who got it going, and it's been popular over the years. So we've had times when there's been two or three people, and there's times when it's standing room only and people have to leave. So it just really does fluctuate over the years. I was going to ask you about that. How, how do people get involved? What's the criteria for entering the group? Um, all that. 
Well, in general, um, we don't accept things like poetry and screenplays because that's just a little bit hard to judge, right. you know, as a as an author and as a writer. So uh, we prefer novels or, um, you know, maybe nonfiction. Uh, we had one woman come and write a bestseller here, uh, Wesley the Owl. Her name is Stacy O'Brien, and she wrote the most poignant story about her life with an owl. So and and then it hit the number twelve on the bestseller list. So that was really exciting for all of us to watch. You know, somebody make it. Not only are you a writing group, but you are published as well. Many of your authors are published. Um, talk about that process because I think that a lot of people, probably everybody at one time or another has said, I want to write a book. But then where do you go from there? So talk about the process. It's a very tricky process. Um, I have a master's degree in writing and so it's like that's where I thought it was going to go. But the the writing community doesn't always cooperate with your goals. So sometimes you have to think outside the box. I got very lucky. I met um, my business partner, Geneve. Uh, we met in this group and we sat down one night and we discussed what we wanted in a publishing house. And after we were done, we actually had a list and I said, I think we have a publishing house. And she said, yeah, I think we do. And so we actually started um, World Nouveau, which is has an imprint called Mischievous Muse Press. And we uh, publish books, and so we were able to hand select some of the authors um, in this group. They submitted to us, we accept their books, and so these are some of the books that we published, and um, it's going really well. It's really fun to watch them launch their books. We go to the Book Frog locally here in, in the mall and do book launches with them, and um, you know, it's fun to fulfill the dreams of these authors. Um, but you are also the art director, and when we think of books, I think that the cover of the book is always so important. How does somebody know what to select for artwork? Well, you have to really tune into the book and see what's appropriate for the story itself. Um, so definitely an art director has to read the books. Okay. <laughs> but also, it's not just about the book, because what the cover needs to do is entice a person it's not just tell it like it is it's it's more uh, a psychological effect mm -hmm. and so you really have to tune into what would speak to a person not just what would tell a person that what the book was about what was it like for you the first time you saw your book ready to go and ready to sell you mean as an actual book yes. like this like holding it yes. as an actual book <laughs> yes <laughs> It was awesome. Yeah, just having having the the book be real um, cuz I'm one of those people that took a lot longer <laughs> to write it. it. Took me 7 years. But the, but it was a trilogy, so it took me 7 years to write all three books, okay. uh, 900 pages. But um, but it was for the first one, just seeing the first one all done and real and uh, especially seeing it on a bookshelf in a bookstore. Okay. That was really where it hit me was just like, wow, this is something real that I put out into the world. So. And you can see more about authors in our community on upcoming episodes of Around the Peninsula, so check your local listings. There has been a growing concern over the coyote population on the peninsula. As a result, many residents have questions regarding what they can do to be safe. Liz Brown Swanson discussed the situation with a wildlife specialist and a city official to get some answers. Well, recently we've gotten a lot of calls about coyote sightings in the, in the community, and, and we did have one incident that I'm aware of where we had a coyote attack on a small animal. So naturally the city be concerned with public safety and wanting to be able to educate the community about what coyotes are and how to live with them. So we're kind of moving towards an educational campaign to the community to, to help them understand exactly how do you live with coyotes and coexist with them. I guess the key is to learn how what to do and what not to do. So let's just start off with... Um, what do you do when you know there are coyotes that are, you know, in your yard? What do you do? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing is if you have a coyote in your neighborhood, is first not to worry. The vast majority of coyotes are very afraid of people, and they will actually go out of their way to avoid us. Um, but if you do have a coyote in your yard or neighborhood that isn't running away from you when they see you, the most important thing to do is to look big and loud. So we call this hazing a coyote. So there's lots of fun things you can do. You can uh, buy an air horn, one of these little air horns you can find at any party store. Uh, you can blow it and it makes a loud noise. That'll scare any coyote away. Maybe right. uh, neighbors and kids and, and pets in the neighborhood. <laughs> 
You can carry a whistle with you when you're walking your dog, and if you see a coyote, you just blow the whistle. Uh, you can even make homemade hazing tools. So this is just a sippy cup with some pennies in it, or you could put dead batteries in it, just shake it at the coyote. And what happens is they will learn through those noises that people are scary and they'll avoid us. Um, the other important thing is if you see a coyote in your yard or your neighborhood, you always want to stop and think, why are they here? And the answer almost always is food. So if you have pet food outside, um, fruit trees are a big attractant for coyotes. They actually, a lot of their diet is made up of fruit. So if you have fruit trees and the fruit's fallen on the ground, it's really important to pick it up. Uh, if your trash is overflowing or not secured, you want to secure that. So, you know, making sure that you don't have any food attractants is really important. And talk to your neighbors. You know, let them know in a nice way. You know, these fruit trees you have here are attracting coyotes into the area. And then finally, if you have pets, it's very important never to let your pets outside unattended. For more information on coyote safety, you can go to their website at humanesociety.org. And now it's time for our Green Beat, where Mark J. Dottie finds out how the Terranea Resort is helping to keep our oceans clean.
And when we come back, we'll have tips to help you get set for the holidays. And in sports, a Dodger pitcher and his wife have a lot to celebrate, and we'll tell you why when we come back. They might surprise you. Search We Can for more ideas on how you and your kids can get healthy together. Hi, I'm Deputy Chris Knox, here to remind you of the importance of traffic safety near our schools. School zones are always 25 miles per hour. The school zone only applies when students are outside the school in the morning and the afternoon. Parents should always allow extra time when dropping off their children and should know the school's drop-off routes and procedures. Motorists should also focus on safe driving near schools. Some of the violations I see near schools are cell phones, speeding, double parking, seat belts, and child safety seats. Students should always remember to cross safely at intersections and not to run out in front of cars. When we follow these rules, we can all stay safe. And in sports, we are happy to announce that Dodger pitcher Clayton Kershaw has been awarded the Roberto Clemente Award for 2012. Now this award is given out every season to players who have given back to our society in honor of the great baseball player and humanitarian Roberto Clemente. Clayton Kershaw was inspired by his wife's dream to build a school in Africa. And since then, Kershaw's challenge was born. But Clayton is not the only Kershaw receiving an award. Last year, I had the opportunity to interview Ellen Kershaw about her dream, and that story has won a National Telly Award. Here's a clip from Ellen Kershaw's interview. Ellen Kershaw stands with her husband Clayton as all of his baseball dreams are coming true. Now Clayton is pitching in to make one of Ellen's dreams a reality. I read that you actually saw an uh, interview on the Oprah Winfrey show <laughs> with the kids and the people that had been, gone to Africa. So tell the story and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah. So eighth grade, Oprah changed my life. Okay. Kind of. We, um, I just was watching her and I saw the kids on TV and I saw their faces and it just seemed surreal. I feel like we just live in this bubble sometimes in America, especially at that age where we just kind of feel like the world revolves around ourselves. And yeah. so for me to see just a picture of that and just a glimpse of something that just seemed so foreign was amazing. And so right then and there, I knew that that was what I was meant to do. It just, I felt so ingrained in my blood that that's what I needed to do someday. And it took a long time to get me there. I felt like I'd never been out of the country, never been anywhere by myself. And so for me to get that first passport stamp was really exciting, but it took six years for me just to kind of grow into the thought that this is what I needed to do. And I realized how important those six years were because I really do feel like I grew and matured during those years yeah. and, and really wanted to make it my own. So I just went over there by myself and really feel like I found 
a lot of who I was over there, you know. What was that like for you to go, I mean, all the way to Africa? You talk about yeah. leaving the country and it being so foreign. What was, were you yeah. scared? Were you nervous? Or? Well, I mean, I should be. Every part of the trip, I mean, I, I got on a British Airways flight and I'm sitting there and I'm 18 years old and just waved goodbye to everyone I knew. And it was amazing, just this sense of peace that kind of came over me, just that this was it. This was kind of, I'd almost gotten anxiety from not going and from not answering that call that I just kind of felt like I was right where I needed to be. And another thing that you're working on, of course, is Kershaw's Challenge. Yeah, yeah. and talk about that because we want mm -hmm. people to know about that. Mm -hmm. So when we got back, it was really cool because everyone was really interested and in wanting to hear about our trip and everything. And so we just decided it is awesome to raise awareness and it's awesome to get the word out about it. But what's even cooler is to put something into action where people can jump on board and keep, people can be a part of something. And so it was Clayton's idea. He was like, you know, I really want to do something that with every strikeout I make, I want to be able to give. And that way, when people are watching me pitch, they're able to see that there is something in life that is so much greater than baseball happening. And so I was just blown away and so touched by that idea. So we started Kershaw's Challenge because um, there's a little girl over in Zambia named Hope, and she has just stolen our hearts. She's 11 years old and HIV positive and um, a double orphan. And so it's just um, we... She's our inspiration, and we want to have a home for her. And so we decided to build Hope's home, and it's basically going to be an orphanage to house 12 to 15 kids and just a place where we are able to take them out of their environment and just let them thrive. And it's amazing how far encouraging words, food, and just a, a safe place to call home, it's amazing how far that can take these kids. And so, I mean, if we're able to get 12 to 15 kids and just be able to raise them in this house, I mean, the sky's the limit for them. And so it's been cool to see how people have just come on board with us and wanted to be a part of it. And we still have a ways to go, but we feel like we've been called to do this and we want to make a difference. And we want to give these kids a home and a chance. And so we're, we're really excited to see the end result of it. And if you would like to support the Kershaw's charity, you can always go to kershawschallenge.com. If you are a military buff looking for something fun to do, John Clayton introduces us to something new to see at Fort MacArthur. Given the fact that I'm a real World War II aficionado and I love things of the military of that era, I'm absolutely thrilled to be standing beside, and if my military knowledge is correct, I'm standing beside a half track from 1945. And the fact that the museum has this is incredible. So uh, to tell us more about it, Steve, tell us about this half track. I well, mean, those guns look frightening. Well, thank you for admiring our, our baby here. We do love her. She's an M16A2 half track. She was built in 1943 was retrofitted in 1952 and was slated to go to Korea. Now, she never made it to Korea. She ended up staying stateside. But why it's important for, for Fort MacArthur is that in the war, years between World War II and Korea, nobody knew what air defense was going to be, and so they just parked these guys in, at certain places. Fort MacArthur had an M16 half-track, and so we had to get one so that we could properly interpret the interwar years between World War II and Korea. Just so uh, our viewers know, I know what a half track means, but as you see, we have huge tires here, and then behind me over here, we have like a tank track. So, Steve, just explain that a little bit more. The idea was is that this track could take heavy loads and could get to places that a normal, you know, tired vehicle or wheeled vehicle could not go. And they were very successful, used throughout World War II, used in Korea, and believe it or not, the Israelis, they might even still have some in their inventory. So they've been using them for years. Still today? Still today, yeah. Boy, that shows American workmanship and craftsmanship. It's one of the beauties of collecting this old stuff and preserving them is the fact that the generations of Americans that produced this stuff, they made it to last. There's a craftsmanship here that you cannot find today, and it really is a, a work of art. I know our viewers would be fascinated to find out how much... How much does something like this cost and where on earth do you find it? Well, again, exact cost I can't determine for you, but <laughs> what you can do is get on eBay. Get on eBay and look at that. Look at the military vehicles website. 
Uh, there are a lot of people, private individuals, that are saving these old... Saving them? Yeah, you know, they're destined for the scrap heap. And what they do is they know, in, inside themselves, they know that there's history in every one of these vehicles. And they save them, and they lovingly restore them, and then ultimately they end up in museums, hopefully. But from my knowledge of things military, I would say that this somewhere is maybe between the range of 75,000 and 100. You're in the right range, for sure. Wow. <laughs> I'm also thrilled to be standing, uh, obviously, beside this vehicle, but over here there are two other vehicles. Uh, just briefly and quickly, what are they? The next vehicle over from us is the M3A1 Scout Car, and it's really important to our area, too, because right after Pearl Harbor, the main concern was a Japanese invasion, and these scout cars actually patrolled the beaches, and they were usually an infantry unit, so we're a coast artillery fort, but we had infantry assigned to us and they use these scout cars to patrol all the way from San Pedro down to Solana Beach and back. I think the other interesting thing is that they're out here and they look in such good condition, they obviously don't remain here. I mean, were they taken from a, a military garage or, or hangar or something? It's a great question. Most of these things ended up on farms as farm utility equipment. Farm equipment? Sure a tracked vehicle out on a on a, a plowed field the traction you're going to get they were very very reliable but what usually happened is all of the armor was stripped off the guns were removed the radios are gone and so when we find them or when these individuals find them they have to rebuild them and so it's like almost like a puzzle piecing each piece back together and in the process there's a real intellectual challenge and there's a real physical challenge and it's just it's good for the it's good for the body to do this i know that one of the great american generals of world war ii was uh, blood and guts uh, general Patton, and Patton was actually a tank man but um i can sort of see Patton in this vehicle with the guns blazing i'm sure he would like the guns of course his first choice is is a tank and uh, we hope that we can honor his his memory with a tank here at some point but that'll be in the future Palos Verdes Peninsula High School is having a student-created art sale on November 17th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Items for sale will include hand-blown glass, ceramics, photos, and note cards. All proceeds go directly to the Peninsula High's Visual Art Booster Club, which supports the school's art facilities. The sale will be held in the faculty parking lot at the corner of Silver Spur and Hawthorne Boulevard. And if it rains, the sale will be held in room S13. And keeping it local, the Point Vicente Interpretive Center will be hosting the local author's book signing event on November 10th at 11 a.m. through 1 p.m. This event will feature an array of books focused on the unique beauty and history of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Come meet local authors and have your book signed and receive 10% off all books on the day of the event. Authors include Doug Christie, Bungie Headley, Judith Love Cohen, Ginger Clark, and many more. For more information, you can call 310-377-5370 or go to palaceverdes.com slash rpv. And after the event, you can make a day of it by touring the Point Vicente Lighthouse. And finally, are you looking for some new ideas on setting a great table for the holidays? Well, the women of Las Condolistas held their annual Entertaining for Holiday fundraiser where they demonstrate how to set any kind of table on any kind of budget. Liz Brown Swanson joins us with more. Hi, Maria. I'm here at the fourth annual Entertaining for the Holidays, a beautiful event put on by the women of Las Condolistas. And every year, these women get more creative and have wonderful ideas to help inspire you over the holidays. This is Las Condolistas, one of the major events that we have, fundraising events. And this is called Entertaining for the Holidays. And we have been doing this for the last four years. And then I tell you how excited we are, because this is the time that we make use of our creative juices and we inspire people to do their own entertaining stuff for the holidays right at the comfort of their home. The best tip I have is to mix and match. Um, what ties the table and all the different elements together is the color scheme. So if you get the colors that go together, um, that uh, coordinate with one another, that's why you can mix the plates. If you'll notice, 
a plate from Italy and a plate from England go together because the greens match and the browns match. Um, and if you'll notice, the napkins are not the same as the tablecloth, but the colors coordinate with the colors in the paisley tablecloth and in the arrangement. Um, the use of the colors in the arrangement brings out all the colors and other in the other elements on the table. So when I think that something might not quite go with something else, then I stick another flower in <laughs> that ties it all together. One day my friend and I were in the, the dollar store and we thought, my goodness, you know, you don't have to spend a fortune to have a, a cute table setting and so we took the challenge and decided that we were going to decorate a table on any, nothing that cost over a dollar and we stuck to that. Everything here was a dollar, the charger, the plate, the cup, the bowl. We took an, a tea towel and full, tied it in a knot and made a napkin out of it and the glasses, the stemware, were actually a dollar. Our table is Frosty, the snowman, an eve of, and we had my, the woman I did this with, Freddie Benson, had these Frosties in her collections. So we made our table with that theme. We only had three, so one of them we had to create a, a melted snowman over on the last plate. I'm Ann Goodhart, and my table is a Christmas table called Dining on Christmas Eve. And all of the, I tried to keep it mostly red and white and silver with a touch of green here and there for Christmas. So it, it's just a lot of fun to gather what you have in all your Christmas decorations and put them all together and make most elegant Christmas table you can. This is called a New Year's Carnival. It all started with the uh, moving uh, Ferris wheel that was given to me by my uh, Uncle Jack and Aunt Eleanor. And from there, the table was inspired with dishes that have come from um, Pier 1. It's to give you kind of a Mardi Gras feel. Uh, this is something you could do at home very easily. We uh, most of the pieces have come from either Party World or um, just extra fabrics we've had at home for doing tablecloths. As you can see, these women are so creative and what wonderful ideas that are inspiring everyone here to go out and decorate for the holidays. Back to you in the studio. Las Condolistas is an organization that has raised more than a million dollars for children's charities and the environment. For more information on this creative group of women, their website is lascondolistas.org. And that will do it for today. For all of us here at RPV-TV, make it a great day.